probably um, one of the, the I'd say, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, probably the, my favorite thing to teach is leadership. I, I really got to say this, and may, maybe it's because of the fact that uh, I've experienced some of the pitfalls of it, I've experienced some of the successes of it, but uh, probably more so than anything, I've just had a lot of opportunity to experience yeah. leadership. And so uh, leadership and, and being a leader both. And so I've had an opportunity really to, to have the, both of those things invested in me, as well as having sat under some real good leaders and to sit on and to have the opportunity to sit under some that really weren't leaders. And I'm not, even the ones that weren't good leaders, I'm not saying they weren't men of God uh, or gifted teachers, but they just, they just weren't gifted leaders. And you're going to, I think you're going to find out over the course of the, the next several months, really kind of the difference. There's certain people that have particular giftedness or whatnot, but they're just not leaders. And, and one of the way the measurables in that, and I've said this uh, for years, is, you know, in leadership, if we're going to have something, we're going to be leaders, it should always come from the premise of sustainability mm -hmm. and reproduction. Yeah. Sustainability and reproduction. In other words, if I'm a true leader, then, then it doesn't just depend upon me. I'm, I'm reproducing something in other people that is going to maintain that momentum. And now I can be a gifted person. And I've seen gifted people. There's people far more gifted than, than I am, and hands down. But they're just not good leaders. Now, if you just put them on a pedestal and you isolate them, and they're like uh, the singer on American Idol competing against a bunch of other singers, man, they're going to shine. Uh, but just don't expect them to ever form a band because they want the spotlight on one spot. Leaders reproduce. Leaders reproduce things that are sustainable over time. I know people as well that do tremendous ministry. And if, if you know what, if you're on the streets with them, well, let's take that for instance, because we're also experienced on street ministry. They're very effective. I mean, great street preachers. You get in a witness with them, fantastic in a witness. I mean, they know the Bible. If you want to deal with issues of apologetics, I'm telling you what, they're like they're like karm.org, uh, just walking around. I mean, they know the information. Yeah. Uh, but they're always by themselves. There's just nobody. They just never reproduce, and there's never any sustainability. So the day that they die or their heart stops, you know what happens? Whatever their ministry was, it dies with them. Yeah. And I've just never uh, desired to have that. I don't want the Troy Bond evangelistic ministry. I don't want the Troy Bond uh, teaching ministry. Uh, that's why we just restore a vision and we evangelize nations. And so if we can restore a vision in multiple people, then we have the capacity to evangelize more nations or more people. We have a more a greater opportunity to disciple more people. And so I believe that genuine leadership, not genuine uh, giftedness or genuine positions, but genuine leadership is always going to be defined by uh, sustainability and reproduction. You're going to reproduce after your own kind. So if you're a good leader, you're always going to be leading someone. I remember uh, years ago, I was doing a Mardi Gras outreach, and there was a team. We, at one point, we had teams that, that represented Raven Ministries really kind of across the country. People had come to our Mardi Gras outreaches, and, we, and that was back when we'd host hundreds of people. And uh, they would come and say, hey, we want to do what you're doing there. And some of them wanted to not just to adopt the principles, but they wanted to kind of adopt the name as well. So they wanted to be uh, Raven here or Raven there, just kind of depending on the geographical place that they, they were. And so at, at, at various times when Sutton just was, was not really representing our heart and our passion, uh, when they come to a Mardi Gras outreach, we find ourselves having to sit down with them and say, hey, listen, if, if you're taking on the name of our ministry, there's certain things that we just don't do. There's certain ways that we just don't carry ourselves. I mean, we're, we're not about trying to be right. We're trying about, about being righteous because the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And so we have to set them down. And, and I remember one that was really, it, it was kind of funny at the time, e even though it was a, a serious matter. And so there, there was a situation in one of our places. And I was talking to these, these two guys that were part of it. And I said, so are any of y'all leaders? And two of them raised their hands. And I pointed at one. I said, so you consider yourself a, a leader there at the ministry where you're at? And he said, yeah. And I said, so who are you leading? And he pointed across the table at the guy, other guy who raised his hand. And I, so I asked that guy, I said, so if he's leading you, who are you leading? And he pointed his finger right back at him. And so they're leading each other. I said, man, you talk about either the, the blind leading the blind or a dog chasing its own tail. But you can't just lead yourself around in circles. 
Well, that's not what leadership is. Leadership isn't just finding one person to agree with you. This, and this was long before the days of Facebook or, or just finding that one friend that's always going to like your posts so you think you're getting affirmed all the time. Leadership is something that's sustainable, something that is contagious, something that's going to build other people up and release them into the ministry that they called them to. Uh, as you get your uh, paperwork and you look at that first chapter, you're going to find out that most of the uh, institutes of higher education, especially the Ivy League schools, in this nation, they began really as religious institution for religious training, whether it was Harvard or whether it was Yale. I mean, you had Yale Divinity School. I believe it was uh, uh, part of the Presbyterians, and you had Harvard. And all these organizations uh, really functioned as places to train ministers because most of the people that came into this nation early on, whether it be the Puritans or others, really were, were really solid in the faith. And their desire was is not just to educate people but build them up and, and to have that sustained, really, uh, morality in this nation. That's why you look at all the, the documents of the Founding Fathers. They're all peppered with, with language that at least uh, acknowledges a higher power, these, 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 these rights that have been uh, given to us by our Creator. And we, so they acknowledge the Creator because most of the institutions of higher learning that would later come around were built upon those premises. Well, the problem with that was they, they, they moved from really a spiritual sense in the sense of building people that done the ministry of the gospel to the information of the gospel. And so while you're going to get some information over the next few months, I'll tell you what, if all you get is a bunch of information that you can regurgitate to someone else, uh, I've failed in what I'm talking to, I'm talking to you about over the next few weeks. Really what this is all about is building the character of leaders so they can walk in genuine leadership. And that's really what it comes about. It's understanding what leadership is. And for us, leadership always operates from the basis of servanthood. Yeah. You know, Jesus said that I have not come to be served, but I've come to what? Serve. I've, not, I've not come to serve, be served, but I've come to be a servant. Yeah. And so his, so the whole uh, uh, philosophy of, of Jesus' ministry was to serve others. He served us, obviously, by coming and living and dying and raising again. He served upon us the ministry of reconciliation. We'll talk more uh, 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 closely, look at that uh, here just in a little bit. And so it's always based upon that. How can I serve? And so if you're serving, there's an aspect of leadership that's being built because you'll only lead to the degree that you're first willing to serve. And so if you, if, you, if you don't remember anything else over the next six months, remember that. You're only going to lead to the degree that you're first willing to serve. If you're not willing to serve, I don't know who in their right mind would be willing to follow you. Period. Amen. Unless somebody's just looking for somebody to put a stranglehold on them and just tell them what to do and point fingers. A lot of people think, listen, I want to be the leader. I want to be the set man. I want to be the, the lead man. I want to be the pastor. That way I don't have to do anything anymore. Come on. People really think that. It's Come ridiculous as it sounds. If, you, if you've been around church life for very long, it's always let me get to the position. That way, now I've earned the right just to simply tell other people what to do rather than I've earned the right to show other people yeah. what to do. And isn't that the difference that you saw in the ministry of Jesus versus the ministry of men? Jesus says, come and follow me. Come and watch what I'm doing, and I'm going to teach you. In the case of Luke chapter 5, it's to be fishers of men. You'll henceforth fish for men. And so whatever he did, whether he was going out to pray, whether he was leading people to, 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 uh, to, uh, to Christ, what, to himself, through salvation, whether he was teaching in the synagogues, it was always, I want to set an example for you to follow. I'm going to show you what to do. I'm not going to give you a book on what to do and yeah. tell you to figure it out and read the instructions. I'm going to demonstrate these qualities in you. He did that right up to the, to the point where he's ascended. And he said, these things that I do, what do he say? You'll do also. Reproduction. Sustainability and greater works because I go to be with the Father. And so there's the reproduction, there's the sustainability. That's where I get that from, just watching the ministry of Jesus. And so this, this week one is really talking about the, the nature of leadership. And so if I had to ask you to give me a definition of the word nature, what would you say? If I said, give me a definition of nature. Now I'm not talking about nature lovers or or uh, nature's best vitamins, or I'm not talking about, so if I said, what is, if something is by nature, how would you define that word? Natural. What? Natural. Natural. So well, let's take the same root word and just say it in a different way and give the definition. So how would you define that word without using that word? Isn't there like a game that's played sometimes you have to get, guess the word without using the word? 
The woods. What's that called? It's wooded. Go ahead. You're going to do the end. Okay. Nature is what defines you. Intrinsic qualities. What is it? Intrinsic qualities. Intrinsic qualities. Okay. Now we're, now we're getting somewhere. Inher- it's another word for intrinsic would be an inherent quality. Or those, found, those, those, those qualities that are found present in somebody's life or being. Okay. So if, I, if something is by nature, it's an in, another word would be inborn. There's certain qualities that you were born with. You know, you say, somebody says, well, man, you sure are ugly. You say, well, listen, I'm sorry. This was the face that I was born with, yeah. right? So the certain, or you sure are beautiful. You know, we always pick on the ugly people. But, uh, you know, you sure are beautiful. Well, I was just born beautiful. I was a beautiful baby. Or, you, you know, or maybe you sure are tall. Well, there were certain qualities genetically that my family gave to me that made me to be a tall person or a short person. And so certain things that we have are inherent to us. The qualities are there. So, but if I ask you how you would describe leadership, how would you describe leadership? See, something by nature, I mean, we can guess it. Even if we say natural, you know what you meant by that. You know, we dig a little deeper in here in qualities or those things. But if I said, what is leadership? Man, it's like, wow, man, now you're just opening it wide up. And so if, if I asked you, Smiley, how would you define leadership? Leadership. 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 That's a great question. <laughs> Here those people always say that and you ask them, but that's a great question. Then they answer the question. You think? Yeah, the word ship is like obviously a vessel used to navigate. Okay. And the word er is in the sense of a, a type of, you know, like uh-huh. opposing force, but leading is the obviously being able to, to travel through those opposing things. So it's like leadership is that whole word. But I guess the answer I would say is just lead by example. Whatever you heard me say, leading by example, okay? So he's got bits and pieces. He's, re- he's remembered something he's heard me say. Amen? Leadership? Anybody else have a definition of leadership? How would you describe leadership, Samir? Okay, process of an ability to show something. Or the what? Or the process or the ability to show some way. Okay, I'm going I'm to kind of put together the pieces that, that Smiley kind of tossed out into the table like a Yahtzee game. And so leadership is this. So the word lead means to show the way. Okay, here's what Samara said. She just gave the other piece of what you were talking about. To show the way through one's conduct or influence. So if I'm going to lead somebody, I'm going to show somebody the way through my conduct or through my influence. Closely related, obviously. Conduct could, could, could relate to my conversation. It could relate to my work ethic. It could relate to what I'm actually putting my hand to in the ministry. So if I'm leading, I'm giving an example. I'm, I'm influencing somebody through my personal conduct. And so er, here's that word you were looking for. The definition. It's, it's an interjection, which means hesitation or uncertainty. And so the, just that er, lead er, er is a hesitation or an uncertainty. It's, just a, it's, a, it's an interjection. Then ship, obviously, it's a means of transport. And so leadership is to show people a way or means to get through times of uncertainty. That's what it is. If I'm uncertain, what do I need? I need leadership. Now, if I'm certain about something, I don't need leadership. Why? Because I'm already there. And so leadership is precisely designed to bring people through times of uncertainty, times of, of difficulty, times that, that they don't have the answer. And so if we're looking at the subject of leadership as leaders, we need to be those persons that are ideally equipped to bring people, to, to, to provide a way through uncertainty, through times of difficulty. Folks, listen, I, I've known people that are in quote-unquote leadership positions that create more uncertainty than they ever deliver people from. Come on. Period. They're, they really are. And, and I see it. I see it many times. You know, and, and sometimes, you know, it's a situation I had a conversation a number of years ago, and somebody said, listen, in our church, we need more leaders. Well, because they had a lot of things they wanted to do. They, they wanted a youth ministry. They wanted a children's ministry. They wanted an outreach ministry. And they said, we need more leaders. And I had to correct them. I said, no, you don't need more leaders. You need more leadership. Because until you have leadership... There's no sense in having leaders. You need to have a mindset and a philosophy in place. That way, when the people are put in place, they know where to take people. Amen. There's no sense in, in bringing together a committee. Uh, Brother V was just at, at a meeting recently and with, a, with a group of people, and he said, you know what? Five people there. He said, all five of these quote-unquote leaders of this group, organization, church, whatever it was, 
He said every single one of them had a different idea of what it was supposed to look like. Because you can't do that. Amos 3.3. 3. How can two walk together? Except they be in agreement. So if I'm walking in leadership, I'm not creating uncertainty. Yeah. I've, I've got the capacity to navigate the waters of uncertainty. Amen. And so, you know, the answer for a leader is never, you know what? Ooh, man. Uh, hate to be you. Or, I don't know. Uh, you know on. At the very least, it should be, listen. Let's get before the face of God and let's yes. find out. If I can't lead you through the trouble, at least, lead, at least lead you to the place where we're going to find the answer. But as leaders, we can't throw up our hands and just give up. Yes. Why? Because if we throw our hands up and we give up and we, we tip that, so to speak, to other people, what's going to happen? Man, it's going to be a fiasco. It's going to be a chaos. Yes. A number of years ago, and I mentioned this to somebody, I talked to Pastor Lance Pratt to take us while we were ministering outside of Razzles. Uh, there on uh, in, on uh, in Daytona Beach this past weekend, and I told him I said, you know, I stand here and it's interesting. Just certain things come in, into mind. I said because you know being out there week after week for a number of years, and then being back there ministering, and I told him I said I was standing right here one night preaching in front of this nightclub in Daytona Beach, and I said a young man pulled a knife on me while I was preaching, and I said he told me he was going to kill me. He had a knife on me. And I said I said fortunate for me because I don't like getting stabbed. I said there was a police officer like. Right behind the vehicle that he couldn't see. And I said, yo, man, this guy's got a knife. And he passed it off to a friend. And I saw who he handed it to. And he hit it. Anyway, the police officers went over there. And they, they apprehended the guy. And I told them who had the knife. And sure enough, he pocketed the knife. Anyway, they, they, they took the, the guy into to, to custody. And they, they charged him with whatever charge it was. Then a couple weeks later, I get a telephone call. And this is from the, uh, the, the prosecutor's office. And uh, they asked me to come in and... and do an interview on this case if it was going to uh, be charging this this guy with whatever the, the thing was, attempted assault with a deadly weapon or something like that. Yeah. But the prosecutor asked me, he said, listen, um, are you sure you want to uh, file charges? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I do. He said, well, because if you do, this young man that pulled the knife on you, he's actually in the local police academy. And if he's got this charge filed against him, he'll never be able to be a police officer. So they were more concerned with him being a police officer than they were me getting stabbed. Yeah, and I said, well, that really reinforces the certainty of wanting to do that. I said, if he'll pull a knife as somebody going to be a police officer on a preacher, yeah. I said, you're going to put a gun in his hand and turn him loose on a whole community? Yeah, I said, on. what happens the first time somebody doesn't want it? I said, so now he just blasts somebody away? At that? Yeah. She said, well, I watched it because I had it all videoed. And I used to wear a camera on my, my head. Some of you guys remember those days, a cyborg camera I'd wear. And uh, she said, well, I saw the video, and she said, you didn't seem to be uh, afraid. You didn't seem to, 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 to be in a panic mode. And I said, ma'am, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, take a police officer, for instance. They find themselves in a high-stress situation. You know, maybe something goes down or there's a threat on somebody's life. I said, do you expect them to just fall to pieces and, and maybe just curl up on the ground and in and, and, and fetal position or run away? She said, actually not. They're trained not to do that. I said, well, so am I. I said, I'm the leader of that group. And I said, can you imagine if I had panicked and created a, this, this great stir out there, exactly what would have happened? I said, I'm required as a leader in the, in the body of Christ to keep my wits about me, yes. to keep my eyes open, to make sure that I'm in control of those situations yes. and those situations don't control me. Hallelujah. And so obviously he was filed against. I'm not really sure. I don't remember exactly what happened. But hopefully he's not walking around with a 9 millimeter strapped to the side with the badge that reinforces his, his, uh, his authority in those areas. And so leadership can't be uncertain in times of uncertainty. We've got to be the ones that they can stand. We've got to be the ones that when shots are fired, yeah. uh, that we keep preaching, so to speak, like Gideon Amen. did. You know, he, he's sat through this class a couple, at least three times, I'm sure, in the last few years. And so we've got to demonstrate those type of qualities. Listen, we're going to stand. We're going to be mindful. We're going to be the one that sets the tone. We're not going to be the one that panics. Yeah. And so there's some passages that uh, to consider and remember as we kind of either begin or continue to advance in our leadership development. Some of you guys have been in leadership and demonstrated those things. Some of you are, are developing those qualities or you're advancing those. Look at 2 Corinthians. Interesting enough, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. How many of you in here want to be leaders? One, two, three, four. How many of you have no desire whatsoever to lead anything? Nobody? Okay, so every one of us in some capacity or another want to demonstrate leadership or be leaders. 
Folks, here's where it starts. 2 Corinthians 5 yes. and 17. You, you know this. And therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, right? Yes. All the old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise Aren't you Lord. glad about that? Yes. Folks, I'm glad about that because if that wouldn't have happened to me, I'd have never been a leader. Amen. I couldn't lead from the basis of who I was. There was no, there was nothing to follow. I, I may lead somebody into a mess. I may be like the blind leading the blind or, or like the two friends pointing at each other across the table, but it would have never been anything sustainable or reproducible over time. And so if, before you came to Christ, that you thought you kind of lacked some of those requisite qualities necessary to be a leader in, uh, uh, in the body of Christ, those things should vanish when you're born again, John 3, 3. They should, they should really vanish. And so at the very least, you should have a clean slate. You should come to a point that says, listen, I'm in Christ. All the old things are passed away. Behold, everything becomes new. And so I may not have the, all the qualities to advance, yes. but I'm no longer bound by those things that cause me to be disqualified. All the things that define me in the past, I'm a new person in Christ Jesus. So I'm like the dry race board. The things that I did in the past... They've been wiped off. The, yeah. the way that I thought in the past, those things have been wiped away. I and so uh, the way mama raised me, those things, don't, my personality or who I used to be, those, yeah. those things are uh, vanished away. Why? Because, man, I'm a new person in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And so I'm, right, I'm back to that place where yeah. God can begin to build upon these building blocks of my life. You look at uh, in, the, in, in the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus asked, he said, who do men say that I am? Yeah. What they say? What's the answer? Gives you, gives you pretty good answers. Yeah. I mean, if they said that about any of us, we'd be bowing our chest and saying, oh, yeah, you hear he just, he just uh, uh, liking me too? But we're not talking about mere men. Yes. And Peter chimed in. He said, "Why well, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but our Father is in heaven. He said, you are Petrus. You are the little rock, but I am Petra. He said, upon this big rock, I'll build my church, and the gates yes. of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, Behold, I give you the keys to the kingdom. I, I'm giving you the, the, the information, the pathway into understanding these yes. things that I'm going to tell you. And he said, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Yes. So he gave him he he, he gave him the, 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 the philosophy, he gave him the mindset, he gave him the permission and the invite into that place that he was because he recognized who he was. Yes. And as a result of recognizing who he was. It gave him the capacity to be who God wanted him to be. Thank you, Lord. And so if I recognize Jesus for who he is, yes. then I'm going to be built upon that. Yes. You know, upon this rock, I'll build my church, that truth, that understanding who Jesus is, and yes. the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Thank you, Lord. And so as long as I keep that focus, we know just a few verses down that Jesus began to speak to them about having to go to Jerusalem. He's going to have to suffer many things. Yes. And Peter stepped out of leadership, and he panicked. Yes. He got the knife pulled on him, so to speak. And he panicked. He said, Far be it for me, Lord God, that I'm ever going to let that happen to you. Yes. No way. It's not going to happen. And Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. You've become a reproach to me. Yes. You lost focus. You, you cease to function from the right mindset of leadership. Yes. You're more concerned with the things of men yes. than the things of God. Yes. Folks, unfortunately, because of the mid management approach to, approach to leadership in so many churches and ministry, we're more concerned with the way men function rather than the way God functions. Amen. And we can fall into that, whether it's the, the way men function through academia, whether it's the way men function through business and all the bottom line philosophies of those things. Folks, many times we get more concerned with the way men think of things. I may have shared with you a number of years ago a church that I came out of before I started pastoring. A cousin of mine was still involved in that ministry, and uh, they were meeting one day at an IHOP having breakfast, and, and they, uh, they were having a meeting. He just happened to be a part of this group. It was going to meet with a guy that was going to come into church in a position of leadership. Yeah. And the guy got out of the car, and one of the pastors looks, looked through the window, and he, and he said out loud, he said, see, he's got the look. He's got the look. Yeah. In other words, he, he had all of these things outward. In total violation of, of what we see in, in, in 1 Samuel 16, men look at the outward appearance, but yeah. God judges the heart. you got to look below the surface. It didn't matter if this guy had been messing around with his, his wife. It didn't matter if he had a secret cocaine habit. Yeah. It didn't matter if he had embezzled money from his job. He had the look. He had the look. He had the, what we were looking for, the yeah. look. Another church that I've been uh, uh, 
I've been friends with several people in it for the last 25 or more years. Uh, one of the guys in the church told me that in, in one of their meetings that they had, they had uh, uh, made a decision that they would no longer hire staff people over the age of 30 years old. Ah. No longer would hire staff people over the age of 30 years old. Anybody who's older than that, they were just going to drop off through attrition or retirement or whatever else. But anybody else that was going to come in, they were going to be hip. They were going to be less than 30 years old. Well, if you're less than 30, old, 30 years old, that sounds pretty good. But if you're the person having to listen to the person less than 30 years old, oh, you're thinking, yeah. man, why don't you like get some experience? Why don't you get some wisdom? Why don't you go? Now, folks, I can say that because I was a pastor 24 years old. And you know what I needed probably about half the time? I needed somebody to slap me upside my big head and say, son, you need to, you need to calm down. You need, to, you, you need to get a little wisdom. You need to, 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 to humble yourself just yeah. a little bit. Yeah. But see, it's always focused on those outward things. But God is consistently looking at our hearts. So 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man's in Christ, he's a brand new person. Yeah. All the old things are passed away and everything becomes brand new. So consider this. That not only that, when there's a, a change of who you are, look what comes with it. In verse, this is verses 18 through 21 of that 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Yeah. We, love, we love 517 because, man, it sets us free from being lost and we, we get to be like Jesus and we're no longer bound by the things of our past. But, man, I'm glad it doesn't stop there. And so look at there's a commissioning that accompanies that covenant. Yeah. Now, I'm a covenant guy. I'm in a covenant relationship through, with Jesus through the finished work of the cross of Calvary. You know, he, he made a covenant. I'm, I'm the covenant, of the, the new covenant in his blood. Yeah. But see, if I don't want to stop with just a covenant. I want there to be a commissioning. I want there to be something that accompanies the covenant. I want to have something that's going to put the covenant to work. And yeah. so uh, the, it, there's a covenant that comes through knowing Jesus personally. Look what verse 18 says. And all of this is a gift from God yeah. who brought us back to himself through Christ and God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. How many of you are glad you're saved? Amen? Amen. Man, I'm glad I'm saved. Amen? I'm glad I'm born again. Man, I'm saved. I'm sanctified. And I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and that with fire. So, man, I can just sit somewhere and fold my arms and prop my feet up and talk about how good a thing that happened to me. Maybe one day as I'm sipping on my lemonade and maybe watching my reruns of some Jesus show on TV, he splits the eastern skies and he sees me there so tickled to death of having been saved and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. I don't think so. Man, I'm glad you got born again. That way you could just camp out and do nothing for the next 50 years. Oh, hallelujah. Man, praise God. I got past who I was. And, man, man, I go to church and, and drop a few shekels in the offering plate. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't say nothing too bad or watch nothing too bad. Don't slap my wife around or abuse my children. Mm, hallelujah. Man, he's a radical. Man, he's a pillar of the church. Yeah. I can probably be on the deacon board. Man, real lucky and get enough votes. Man, I can probably be the chairman of the deacon board. And you know what? I, I, I'll probably be so spiritual at that point. I can tell the church who the pastor needs to be. I can be the guy that's on the pulpit committee, and I can give the pastor the what for. I don't do nothing, but I can sure tell him what to do. Man, I don't, I don't walk in obedience, man, but you know what? But God's given me a position. I can be like, folks, that sounds ridiculous, don't it? Yeah. That's what the modern church looks like. Yes, it does. I got a bunch of do-nothings telling somebody else to do something. Amen. Folks, that's not what we were born again for. That's not Come what on. leadership looks like. He said, this is the gift of God who brought us back to himself through Christ and has given us, not yeah. them or not somebody else, the task of reconciling people to him. Yeah. And so the gift is that now we are now under no obligation to cling to anything that was. So my gift is I'm free. I'm not just forgiven, but I'm free. Mm -hmm. yes. You hear me? I'm not just forgiven. I'm free. Amen. You ever seen that thing? Uh, Christians aren't perfect. They're just forgiven. Right. My goodness. That's why you have all these people rear into folks. It's like, I ain't even going to pay attention. I'm just going to rear in that car and get rid of that bumper sticker. Yeah, we're just, we're not perfect. We're just forgiven. And so we're no longer defined by anything that existed on that side of faith or on the finished work of the cross of Calvary. So my gift is that no more do I have to cling to those things that were. That's the gift of God. Man, that is what he did for me because I'm a new creature. And so if I cling to those things, I can't press towards those things. Yes, yes. 
And so when I'm in Christ, that, 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 that covenant brings me to a place that qualifies me for a commissioning. And so here's my question. How many of the things that you claim limit or prevent you from demonstrating biblical leadership now? Okay. How many of those things? Because I can say, hey, you want to do that? Well, I can't do that. Oh, what about this? No, I can't do that. What about this? I don't feel confident in that. Well, can you do this for me? No, I just couldn't do that. So how many of those things that limit or prevent you from demonstrating genuine Christian leadership now are things that you carried over from when you who you were before coming to Christ? Did he say it again? Man, I can't do that. Well, why can't you? Well, because, you know, I used to be such and such. Or I'm this or... I'm too shy, or I'm too backward, or I'm too fearful. Well, where'd you find those things at? Does those things come in your Jesus bag of tricks? So what you're telling me is when Jesus commissioned you, he handed you a bag full of excuses. Yeah. Is that what he did? So how many of the things that keep you from being who you need to be in Christ are just simply things you smuggled in from a, a previous life? Amen. Right. You ever think about that? You've smuggled all of these things in to a relationship with Jesus yeah. that bring you into that place that violate everything that you agreed to in that covenant relationship. Come on. See, we don't think about those things. So here's the other question. Does your natural birth yes. have dominion over your spiritual birth? Come on. Are you more controlled by the natural birth of things than you are the spiritual birth? Folks, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I'm not bound by, by my natural birth. Yeah. Because naturally, man, I didn't come from a family with a great pedigree. I didn't for years and years. My mother and father struggled with, with, with alcoholism and, and it, pretty much everything under the sun, fighting and all that. Man, I'm so glad that I'm not defined by those things. Yeah. I tell people all the time, man, my mom and dad uh, you know, claimed to be religious for a long time, but they just weren't very good at it. You know, they didn't claim to be atheists. They didn't shake their fist at God or, or tell people that they were agnostic. Man, I tell you what, here they talk, man. They, they had a front row seat in the kingdom, man. They were just waiting for that great by and by. But, man, they were horrible at it. And I said, man, I don't, I don't, I don't like that version of it. I don't, I don't want that one. Man, I want something else. I don't want my natural birth to have dominion over my spiritual birth. Look at how Paul the Apostle describes this in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 9. He said in, in, in 8.5, he said, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. Okay, question. Do you think about sinful things more than you think about spiritual things? Come on. Well, he said, do you? I mean, when we well, well, think about sinful things, I'm going I'm to qualify that in just a second. So, what is the sinful nature. It's that which you existed in or with before coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not a trick question. It's those things which defined and limited you outside of your relationship with God. That's who we were. We were sinful by nature. This is how we were. You know why dogs bark? Because they're dogs. Dogs don't meow because dogs aren't cats. Amen. And so Sinful people do Sin. sinful things. Yes. It's not, it shouldn't be a surprise. I, I like it when I'm talking to a ranked sinner, a total unbeliever, and he's po apologizing for using profanity. Oh, I know you're a preacher. I'm sorry for talking like that. I said, dude, don't worry about that. That's just how you talk. You know, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is going to speak. Yes. You're just acting the way you So we shouldn't get excited or, or bent out of shape, but we see a sinful world acting sinful. You see, you can't legislate morality. We need to outlaw this. I can't believe there's gay marriage. I can't believe there's all this thing. What do you expect them to do? Yes. You expect wicked people to do righteous things? Come on. You expect them to be instantaneous hypocrites? They're going to do things that are contrary to who they are by nature? I don't expect that. No. I'm not going to march on Washington and say don't do that. Just because you call it a marriage doesn't make it a marriage. You can call it whatever you want to, but God's the one that is ordains marriage. So, Amen. man, get you 15 certificates. Man, buy you four or five wedding cakes. Cut them off. Slice me off a piece while you're at it. I mean, big deal. I, you're going to do sinful things because you're a sinner. Yes. Folks, that's, the church has tried to flip-flop that. And we want 
sinful people to do righteous things, then we get bent out of shape and they don't. And so, question, what are sinful things? Ooh, what are sinful things? Man, you're thinking some bad, oh, I can tell you a few sinful things. Have you ever done sinful things? Well, sinful things, by definition, are really that which falls short of any prescribed standard by which God intends for us to function. Yes. Period. That's what a sinful thing is. A sinful thing is those things that fall short of the standard that God has for us. So sinful things are not just those things that we see mentioned in 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 9, and 10. We, we, we like to preach that stuff on the streets, you know. All those, all those things about, you know, the, the, the homosexual and the liar and yeah. the thief and the murderer and all. We like, those are, sin, those are big sinful things. Those are things that are easy to identify. But, but what about the sinful things called fear? Come on now. Or the sinful things called doubt or unbelief or yeah. inadequacies or iniquities or unforgiveness yeah. or bitterness. What, what about those sinful things? Because all of those things also fall short of the prescribed order in which God has for us. Amen. And so that's disorderly. Yeah. If a person walks disorderly is what the scripture says. Yeah. It says after the second or the third admonition, call him a heretic. Yeah. What's a heretic? Somebody that doesn't walk in the truth of God's word. Amen. And so you can find yourself disorderly by, by running around on your spouse or by walking in fear, doubt, and unbelief. Amen. Either way, the Bible says those are sinful things that flow out of a sinful nature. Yes. And so it says that those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So what pleases the Holy Spirit? You want to be pleasing unto him? I want to be pleasing unto him. Yes. But I want to know I want to know what pleases him so I can be pleasing to him. And so, does obedience please him? Yes. yes. Pastor Alex pre pre preached a long series on humility. Yes. Humility pleases him. Amen. What about self-denial? Yes. Which what functions with self-control? Do those things please him? Yes. But if I man, if I'm controlled by my sinful nature, I'm yes. not going to be able to do those things that please the Spirit. So, Amen. let's jump. Verse, verse, uh, verse 6 of Romans 8 says, So, letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. Yes. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life yes. and peace. Yes. So, if I let the, the Spirit control my mind, it's going to lead me where? To it's going to lead me to life. And peace. And it's going to lead me to peace. So, leadership is less about what you do yes. and more about how you think. I want to say that again. Leadership is less about what you do. People think, hey, I'm in leadership. Well, what do you mean? Well, I'm a pastor. Well, I'm in leadership. What do you do? Well, I'm a worship leader. I'm, I'm in leadership. Well, what do you do? I sit on the board of deacons or I'm an elder. Yes. Well, tell me how you think. Come on. Because you know what? Even as a pastor for 30 years now, I, I have more people asking me what I do more than they ask me how I think. They don't really care how I think as long as I do something. Folks, I never want to be defined by what I do. Yes. Because there's certain things I do I could train a chimpanzee to do. That doesn't make a chimpanzee a leader. Yes. It just makes him able to do things that he's taught how to do by rote. But how do you think? I want to walk thinking like him. I want to have the moral compunction to think yes. differently. I want to walk with a heart of repentance. Unless you repent, you'll perish. Unless you repent... You'll find, you'll find yourself succumbing to the old nature. That's what repentance is. Repentance is never, it's not a response to sin. It's a response to righteousness. It's the goodness of God, not the sinfulness of men, that lead a man to repentance. Now, yeah, in the process of being drawn to that, yeah, you're going to turn away from sin and you're going to turn to God because he's not just leading you away from sin into some abyss. He's leading you from sin into into his presence, into a place of obedience towards him and humility and submission yes. and self-denial and self-control. That's where repentance or that way of thinking is going to take me. And so as a man thinketh, Proverbs 23, 7, 1, in his heart, he is. Yes. And so if I think in my heart and in my mind from the premise of godly, Christ-like, Christ-imitating leadership, that's who I am. Yes. Now, that's who I am before I'm ever doing it. Amen. Do you hear me? Yes. It, it's funny, when I first started pastoring at, at 24 years old, man, I, I said to myself, man, I've never done this before. Amen. Here I was working in, a, in, in, uh, in business and working in finance and going to church and, 
uh, winning my co-workers to the Lord and having a Bible study in my house and laying hands on the sick and casting out devils and and reading my Bible and praying. But man, I've never done that pastoring stuff before. <laughs> Did you hear that? Amen. See, that's what I thought. Yes. See, I was doing all of the things yes, you were. that I would be doing as a pastor. Amen. Oh, man, I can't be doing this. Man, I, I was counseling people. Man, I was sharing Jesus. I was studying yes. my word. Yes. But man, I can't do that pastoring stuff. That's too hard. Don't, don't we think about that sometimes? Amen. Well, I could never do that. Why? Because we put more weight on a position yes. than we put up on the person of Christ who's come into our life. Come on. And so when the word tells us that our gift will make room for us, why? Because it's already present before anybody ever recognizes those things. Hallelujah. And so for me, man, I was nervous. Man, I'm a pastor now. Well, little did I know I had already been pastoring, shepherding, and caring, and yes. nurturing, doing all these things in people's lives. So the second I stepped into that, quote, unquote, arena of that, man, it didn't feel weird. Why? Because I'd already had that on. Yes. I just didn't call it what somebody else called it. Yes. And so, folks, that's what you're going to find. God's going to be working on who you are before anybody ever calls it anything and says something about what you do. So in my over now over 30 years of public ministry, pastoring, teaching, church planning, evangelism, I've heard that people use the excuse of who they were yeah. or their sinful nature as a reason to keep them from walking in complete obedience to pleasing God. I've heard more people use those things as an excuse. Well, listen, you just don't understand where I came from. You just don't understand those things. You don't understand my sinful nature. Come on. Now, I know who you were. But, man, you know what? man? And, and Jesus, man, he was enough for you because you weren't ever in a game. He was enough for you because, man, you never did drugs. He, he was enough for you because you never were an alcoholic. Come on. He was enough for you because you, you never dealt with mental illness. He was enough for you because... You, you, you never uh, were, were molested. You, he was enough for you because you know how people do. All, they say that. But you know what? Man, he just wasn't enough for those that had any problems. Come on. He wasn't enough for those that were rejected and despised or abused. He, he's only the savior of those that really didn't need a whole lot of saving. Come on. And that the attitude we adopt. Yes. Rather than saying to ourselves, listen, man, he, he, I may be in the gutter most, but it was to take me to the uttermost. He's willing to reach way down into whatever situation I went, w was in and deliver me from it. Because his hand was not too short that he could not save. His ear was not too heavy that he could not deliver. But it's my sin that separated me from him. So he made a way where there was no way. Come on. And so that's why he went out and said, listen, let me remind you, I called the murderer. I called the embezzler. I called the unbeliever. I called the radical. I, I called the, the, the vile. That's who I called. Not many mighty are called. Not many noble are called. I'll use yes. the foolish things of men to confound the wise. Yes. I'm going to use those because at the end of the day, when I set them free, people are looking and saying, man, how on earth did God use that person? Yes. Well, because the same blood... Is what we're built on. That's what brings our covenant together so he can bring commissioning into our life. Yeah. So I hear more people talk about that than hearing people use who they are in Christ as a basis for doing what's pleasing God. I mean, listen, I know who I was, but man, let me tell you who I am in Christ. Yes. You hear me? I, see, let me, can I make a confession to you, Audrey? Man, the Jesus I got saved by is a great big Jesus. Yes. For the record, the Jesus that save me, is God. Amen. He's not a lesser God or somebody that slipped on the yes. scene and put on a robe. On. The, the Jesus I serve yes. is Emmanuel, yes. God with us. Yes. And so he's the God that delivers me from my struggles. He's the God that saved me from my sin. He's the God that I really can do all things through because yes. he's the one that gives me strength. Now, I don't know about the little baby Jesus that served you or the little one that, that hangs around the brown sepulcher of the Catholic Church or still on a cross, and he looks like a little baby in the hand of Mary holding her finger up. But I don't know about that one yeah. that makes you just a poor old sinner saved by grace. But, man, the one that I served not only died on a cross, but three on. days later, he got up. Come on, and he got up. And he's alive, and he's alive forevermore. That's who he is. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. Yes. He is the one that created all things, and all things that were created were created by him and for him. He is yes. that one, amen. That man, he's that one that Jacob wrestled with, amen. He's that one that's always the God of the covenant. He's that one. Yes. 
And so I want to use him as the basis for my obedience and for my strength and for everything that I want to do that I was limited by in my old nature. Do you hear me? Yes. Consider 1 Corinthians 2.16. It says, we have the mind of Christ. Yes. Why? Because Romans 12.2 says, don't be conformed to the image of this world. My old nature, but be rather transformed, or that sinful nature, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, yes. so that you may prove it out what is the good and the acceptable and perfect will of God. Yes. Folks, that's not multiple choice. Do you hear me? Yes. Now, I'm saved now, so I think I, I got three choices. It's either the good, the acceptable, or the perfect will of God. Now, that perfect will, that's a little too tough on me. That's going to cause me some major, yeah. major issues and some Come major on. repentance and major changing. What about just the acceptable? You know, acceptable, you know, it's like, hey, I guess you get in on a technicality. Yeah. Uh, maybe just the good. What's well, good enough? No, that's not. No, everything, every gift, every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from God, the Father of life. There's no variableness in There's no multiple choice. Every bit of God's will is always good. It's always acceptable unto him, and it's always perfect. Do you hear me? It's not this variableness. It's not the multiple choice. It's not like, man, I got the greater Jesus. You got the, the, the lesser Jesus version. Or I got the greater salvation. You got the lesser salvation. Man, I tell you what, God is no respecter of persons in those terms. He makes everything available to us. What he is, yeah. he is a respecter of faith. He is a respecter of obedience. Because be not deceived, God is not mocked. Yes. Whatever man sows, that's what he's going to reap. Yes. And so if you're not reaping... Chances are you're not sowing in the right soil. Amen. Because if I'm going to sow righteousness, I'm going to reap the benefits of righteousness. Hallelujah. If I'm going to if I'm going to sow some sort of compromise and half stepping and unbelief, I shouldn't get surprised when that stuff starts popping up in my life. Amen. You hear me? If I'm going to if I'm going to sow in tears, I'm going to reap in joy. Why? Because sorrow may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. And so I'm going to go to that source. I'm going to plant those things that yes. God has given me a promise associated with those promises. Yes. It leads to life, and it leads to peace. Isn't that what he said? Mm -hmm. It leads to life. It leads, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. This is back to Romans 8, 6. Yes. But letting your spirit control your mind, life, life leads, excuse me, control your mind leads to life and peace. Yes. Folks, why do you think that's important? I'll tell you why it's important because Hebrews 12, 14 says what? What's it say? Without peace and holiness. Yeah. No Follow peace with all men and holiness without. without which no man shall see the Lord. And so if the spirit controls my mind, yeah. it leads me to the essential ingredient necessary for me to see, see, see the Lord. So if I said, listen, without peace, Audrey, it's impossible to see the Lord. If I said that to you, which I just said that to you. And I said, do you want to see the Lord? You say, yes. And I said, well, it requires peace. Yes. Right? Is that what he says? Right? So how do you get peace? Because you're going to need it. When you, if you're going to need it, you're going to see him. So how do you get peace? Huh? Okay, and why? What does that mean? Okay, and why? Break it down to me, because I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. Okay, set apart and do what? Just kind of keep my feet up on the desk and wait for Jesus to come back? Be obedient? Go, so make it simple, because I need it. I need some peace, because I want to see him. Lewis, we need peace, don't we? How am I going to get that peace? By falling where? Make it, make it simple for me. Because I need it easy. Because you ain't going to be around to answer all the questions for me tomorrow. Pick up your cross and follow him. So I not only follow him, but I pick up the cross and follow him. How about just having his mind? Uh huh. <laughs> I like that answer. Uh huh. That'll work. What did you say? Well, I told you what it was in Romans 8 6. He said, Letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. What a trick question. You just always weren't paying attention to what I told you. I gave you the answer before I gave you the question. And so how do I get peace? I let the Holy Spirit control my mind. So much easier, isn't it? I don't have to say, listen, man, if I want peace, man, i got to go out and evangelize three nights a week. They know how I get peace. Now, if I got peace, I may do that, but they know how I get peace. 
Amen. But if I got if I if I got peace, uh, I've, I've got to feed, feed people off my taco truck. If I would get peace, I've got to be nice to Lewis. And I got to be uh, if I if I got peace, I can't, I can't put Audrey on the spot. That's not how I get peace. Amen. I get peace by having the mind of Christ. Yes. Christ, I need let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Yes. Don't be conformed to the image of this world. In other words, don't find yourself obligated by that old nature. Yes. But be conformed to His image. Get His mind. So you can find peace on the other side of his mind. Folks, that's why it's called a peace that does what? Has his understanding. In other words, it's not, it, it's not acquired through much learning. It's not the forever learning, but just simply never coming to the knowledge of tr the truth or thinking myself wise, I become a fool. No, it's just, listen, I'm just coming to that place where I just want the mind of Christ. I just want to understand who he is. I just want to know him so I can then make him known. That's, that's the, 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 the comprehension that comes beyond anything that I can see or understand in the natural. Follow peace with all men, without holiness, on which you see the Lord. So you will never know the absolutely essential peace of God if you allow your sinful nature to control your mind. Never will. You'll never do it. If, it's, if your sinful nature, well, you just don't understand. Well, that's the way I was raised. Well, my mom and daddy said such and such, or my cousin did this, or that teacher scolded me, or I had to wear the dunce cap, or whatever it was. You'll never get the peace of God by allowing all the things of the past to control the way that you think. And as a result, you'll constantly struggle with both life and peace. Yes. And as a result, you will not see God. See, I, I, I don't... I don't make this stuff up. That's what the Word says. Amen. And so, folks, if you can't get a handle as a leader desiring leadership, yes. if you can't get a handle on the life and the peace, you'll never get a handle on the prize. Amen. You hear me? Amen. It will disqualify you from the very thing, the very desire that we had when we came to Jesus. Back to Romans 8, 7 and 8. For the sinful nature is always, somebody say always. Always. It's always hostile towards God. Yes. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. That is why those who are still under the control of their sinful na nature can never, never please. please God. Yes. Now, there's a lot of nevers in there, isn't it? Yeah, never man. was uh, uh, obedient to him. It never will please God. So, folks, listen. When we walk in agreement with our sinful nature, our old self, the word says that we're always hostile oh, towards God. Always. What, what's that terminology? Uh, passive aggressive. Passive. See, a lot of people are passive aggressive. Uh -huh. Now, it's still aggressive. Yes. It's just passive. Amen. Folks, listen. You, you may have a passive hostility towards God that people don't even recognize. Why? Well, because you just don't let it play out. Yeah. But folks, if I walk according and I obey my my sinful nature. But I'm always using who I used to be as an excuse for becoming and being who he says I am. Yes. Folks, the Bible says what? What's he said? I'm always going to be hostile towards him. Can't please him. So, folks, that's when we got to put that old nature in check and say, yes. listen, you're not going to make me an enemy of God by holding on to me. You're not going to be the one that defines me and keeps me from having the peace of God and thus experiencing the promises that God has for me. No more. Why? Because I see, I see what, you're, what you're really trying to do. Folks, listen, that's what our old nature is really trying to do. It's trying to keep us from spending eternity with Jesus. It's not just simply trying to make us uncomfortable. It's not simply trying to cause a few problems and a few relationships. It's not simply going to keep us from, from getting outside of our comfort zone. Folks, that's what we think it does. And we think that's the, 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 the ultimate penalty for those things. But no, that old nature, those things that we cling so tightly to, yes. those things are hell-bent to kill, to steal, and destroy, and to keep us from seeing God. On, they'll brother. dress them up any way that you want them. Dress it up. Yeah. Folks, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be the novelty in your life. Yeah. They'll be those things that you hold to and you coddle. And it was those things that once were and they were so good and so great. Yeah. They'll smile at you. They'll kiss you on your little rosy cheek. But all the way, they are digging their teeth into your throat because they have one desire is to keep you from seeing God. Amen. Why on earth would I want to hold on to something Come on. that has one mission, and that's to destroy me? Come on. And not just to destroy my call or my ministry or my church, yes. 
but to destroy my very soul and see me living in the devil's hell for eternity. Lord have mercy. Because I wanted to walk in this thing that was always hostile towards God. Yes. Amen. It was hostile towards God when I wasn't doing drugs. Amen. It was hostile towards God when I was being respectable to my parents. It was hostile yeah. towards God when I was making straight A's. Yes. It was hostile towards God because it was still just a dressed up, cleaned up version of my old nature. Amen. You hear me? Amen. Yeah, it wasn't some serial killer as the top drug at, drug dealer in Miami. Yes. But it was still my old nature. Yes. Which was willing to give me all of that stuff as a trade off for eternity. Yes. Because that's the way we had to look at those things. Come on. James 4.4. Look at, think about it. We quote it a lot on the streets too. But look at it in line of this truth. He said, you adulterers, you adulteresses. Don't you realize that your friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? Yes. He said, I say it again. Somebody say, I say it again. Say it again. <laughs> he said, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy yes. of God. A friend is yes. literally here in this context is to be bound by those things associated with your sinful nature. If you want to be bound, if you want to have an allegiance to, if you want to have an affinity towards those things that were associated with your old nature, he said, you become an enemy of God. Enemy, I mean, this is, you know, sometimes we just think of an enemy as somebody we have a spat with. But this is something with a deep-seated hostility. Those that are walking according to the flesh, what does it say? They're always hostile towards him. Well, James 4.4 4 tells you why. Because you have an affinity towards those previous things. You're a friend to the way you used to be. And so as a result, you deeply, you have a deep hostility towards God. So I'm going to ask you this question. Ask yourself this question. Why are you so hostile towards God? What, what has made you hostile towards God? Now, you didn't want to call it that. Maybe you want to call it an unmet expectation because that's yeah. a little easier to swallow. Come on. Or maybe you want to call it a disappointment. But what's made you hostile towards God that you can't find peace? What's made you hostile towards God that you can't find holiness or that place of separation? Is but what's made you hostile towards Him? Yes. What What's put you in an adversarial situation yes. towards the things of God that have not only wrecked your past, but they're hell bent on destroying your promise? Yes. What are those things? Because you'll see the fruit of it. Yes. It may be passive, but it's still aggressive. It, it, it may not manifest itself in the First Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, but it certainly manifests itself in a plethora of other things to keep you from walking in the fullness of God. Folks, listen, God didn't save you. God didn't redeem you. God didn't, didn't fill you with his spirit to create some mediocre, barely make it into the kingdom person. Yes. Amen. And if that's who we are, he said, we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Yes. More than conquerors. And unless I'm walking as more than a conqueror, I'm a friend of the world. You hear me? Yes. Unless I'm an overcomer, I've been overcame. You hear me? So what is it that's created a hostility in your heart yes. that you've learned to live with? Why? Because other Christian people live with it every day. And you yes. know what? That's just how it is. No, folks, that's how it was. Yes. That's how it was when we were alienated Amen. from him. That's who we were before yes. we came to Christ. We just dress things up and put on a happy face. Why? Because most people were all too willing to have that version of us. Our sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws. That's namas. God's laws, in this case, they're not just limited, uh, limited to, to what we know as the Mosaic law, but rather it's God's principles or God's way of thinking. Yes. That's what it is. God's principles or God's way of thinking. It never did obey God's way of thinking and never will. Yes. Can't get it. Yeah. Folks, I, I talk to people, witness people all the time on the streets. Listen, you know, I just don't get it. Well, sure you don't get it. You, you're, yeah. you're walking in obedience to your carnal and your natural man. Yes, yes. I don't expect you to get it. It'd be like Amen. me walking up to somebody from Tijuana and, and speaking a language only spoken in, 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 in Tibet. I mean, come on. You didn't, you're not going to get it. I'm speaking a total different language to you. Amen. You're not going to get it. Those things are spiritually discerned. Yes. Unless you're willing to hear spiritually, you're never going to hear what I'm talking about. 
Yeah. Oh, you, you, you hear from God? Yeah. I don't believe it. Well, I'm not surprised you don't believe it. You're an unbeliever. Unbelievers unbelieve. Yeah. Well, what do you mean you don't believe me? Oh, you're an unbeliever. You're a dog. You bark. Yeah. You're an unbeliever. You don't believe. And so we get shocked when unbelievers don't believe. That's why we call them unbelievers. Yes. Well, they have a mindset that's so focused on the world. Yes. And that's where they see from because that's where they think from. So do you find yourself thinking consistent with the way God thinks? Or do you find yourself regularly thinking similar to how you used to think or thought when you were under the control of your sinful nature? Yes. Is it regular or irregular for you to think like you used to think? Come on. And again, we think sinful nature is killing and pillaging and destroying, but what about the fears, the doubts, yes. the unbeliefs, and those things that are just manageable? Folks, the reason that that is important is because those that are still under control of their sinful nature yes. can never please God. Never. Under the control, under that influence of their yes. sinful nature can never please God. It didn't say they won't please Him, but on rare occasions, it says they never can please God. So yes. this should really kind of cause us to shudder, I think, because yes. don't you hear people say, I'm only human? Which really what they mean is, listen, I just want to let you know, I'm saved, but I'm walking under the control of my sinful nature. Yes. They won't put it that way. They'd rather say I'm only human. Ooh, you're only human. Poor thing. You want to get born again? Well, I'm born again. I thought you said you were only human. Because if you're walking in your sinful nature, you're hostile, to, hostile towards God. So yes. you got saved? Where would you get saved from? Well, I got saved from my old life. Well, why are you living in your old life from? Be like me, a lifeguard, rescuing somebody from the ocean and leaving them bobbing out there. You know, like, okay, hey, you're good. Going down for the third time. Hey, you drowning out there? Yeah, I'm drowning. Okay, I declare you not drowning. I'm going to keep sipping on my lemonade. Folks, that's how most preachers preach. Come hey, on. hey, back there, just come up here and cry a little bit and repeat this prayer. I know you're probably still drowning, but hey, listen. At least I can report to headquarters that we had three decisions this week. Yes, come on. You're still drowning. You're going down for the third time, but you know what? Hey, you're good. You prayed the prayer. You're once lost, always lost. I mean, once saved, always saved. But you're only human. Come on. Poor thing, got depressed, killed himself. But man, they're in a better place now. Don't you remember? They came down here and I told them they were okay. Yes. Folks, really? That's what we yeah. think Jesus died for? That's what we really think that, that he gave his life as a ransom for us? Come on. For that? Yes. Verse 9 in Romans 8 says, But you're not controlled by your sinful nature. He said, you're controlled by the Spirit if, yes. you say if, yeah. if you have the Spirit of God living in you. Yes. And remember that those who are, do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. At all. So how do you know if you're, you have the Spirit of God in you? Because you're not controlled by your sinful nature. Yes. It ain't your boom shakalakas. No. It ain't your profession of faith. It isn't that you got dipped in enough water. He said that you're not controlled by your sinful nature. That's how I know that I have the Spirit of God in me. If it doesn't, I don't belong to Him. For the most part, no, it says you don't belong to Him at all. Back to 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. Yes. All things are passed away. What? All things are made new. Yes. Folks, listen, the foundation, we're talking about leadership. The foundation of leadership is Jesus. Yes. It's not personality. Come on. It's not your, your, your theological degree. Yes. It's not enough followers and not enough likes. It's not the size of your church. The foundation of leadership is Jesus. Verse 18 there, 1 Corinthians 5. Yes. And all this is a gift from God. He yes. brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task yes. of reconciling people to him. Yes. And so what did he do? He gave us what he came for in Luke 19.10. Yes. For the Son of Man came, what? But to seek and to save those that were lost. Why did Jesus come? To seek and save the lost. Why did he come? To seek and save those lost. He didn't come to serve on the deacon board. No. He, 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 did, he didn't come to, 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 to be a religious leader. He simply came to seek and to save that which was lost. He had one mandate. I want to seek and save that which was lost. You know what he gave us? 
the ministry of reconciliation yes. to seek and save that which was lost. Man, how many of you ever heard this? I'm so glad you're called to that. You ever, you ever heard that besides me? Man, you evangel- I'm so glad you're called to that. Man, me too. I'm glad I, I'm saved. <laughs> and I'm glad I'm saved. I'm, I'm wondering why you're not. Because, folks, listen. You can't separate those two things. Yes. You can't separate Luke 19.10 from 2 Corinthians 5.18. Sa- I seek and save the lost yes. so that you can seek and save the lost. Yes. That was it. He didn't say I'm going to seek and save the lost. So some of you guys, as a, de- a department of the church, or some of you guys for five days can take a trip overseas, or some of you guys can, can, can go out and do some, 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 some social project. He didn't say that. He said, I came to seek and save that which is lost. And if you're going to be my disciple, you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. You imitate me. Paul said, imitate me like I imitate Christ. Yes. So that's our mandate. Verse 19, for Christ, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against him. And he gave us this wonderful word or message of reconciliation. So we are his ambassadors. We are his representative. We're the Absolutely. ones that reflect yes. him. We're the ones that, that walk. We've been charged. For God is making his appeal through us. Yes. So we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Folks, that is what godly leadership and godly leaders are called to do. Amen. Call people back to God. For Amen. God made Christ who never sinned to be an offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Yes. Folks, I want to give you just a little bit of something. There's, there's two words that we throw around that I want to kind of distinguish just a little bit for you. The difference between leaders versus leadership. Okay. Leaders versus leadership. It's kind, of, it's kind of like a prophet versus somebody that prophesied. You know what I'm saying? There's people that might prophesy. It doesn't make them a prophet. Amen. Okay. There's people that may demonstrate leadership that aren't necessarily leaders. Okay, Amen. There's some people that may nurture and shepherd people. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're quote-unquote a pastor. That just means that they have those qualities that are yes. being developed in their life. So when a person is born again, they have the responsibility immediately of leadership. Amen. M- immediately. And so if they're saying, well, I got saved and I, I don't have any leadership, well, you do because it's deposited, deposited immediately into your life. Because God gives you the directive as a minister of reconciliation. Period. So there's a leadership. There's something working inside of you that's saying, listen, I need to lead the way. I need to lead people to Christ. Yes. That should be instantaneous. And so leadership causes us to lead people. Now, it may be, like I said, it may just be leading the lost person to Jesus, but we're leading somebody somewhere. There's a plan and there's a purpose instantaneously. So people are saying, well, I just don't know my plan and purpose. It's simple. It's to lead people to Jesus. Yes. Now, that purpose, let me tell you something, make it easy on you. That will never change. Never. Do you hear me? Amen. That's the sacredness of the message. Man, what's your plan? What's your purpose? What's your call? Oh, that's simple. It's to lead people to Christ. Amen. Now, that's, that's, the, that's the sacred message. Now, listen, what changes is the method. Amen. Now, that method can change... And, and, and develop and grow. It may grow into that of some uh, governmental office in the church, of a pastor or something. But you know what? The, the same the same goal, the same purpose it, it exists whether you've been the guy that's been pastoring for 30 years or you've been the person that got saved 30 minutes ago. Amen. Period. Same thing. Now, different levels of authority, different Amen. levels of accountability, all these things different as far as the method goes, but the purpose is going to be the same. So don't think for yourself, well, you know, PT and Pastor Alex, you know, they've been in a long time, so, you know, such and such. No, listen, you got the same job. Yes. You do. Now, those things are going to manifest. They're going to grow, and, and there's going to be a greater level of responsibility that you're going to have. But genuinely, you're going to have, you have the exact same purpose that I have. It's to preach the gospel, to make disciples of all nations, yes. to teach them to observe all those things that he taught us to observe. That's it. Now, your circle of influence may not have expanded, but listen, it's going to be there. Initially, that circle of influence is just your old nature. I'm breaking my flesh under subjection, like Paul said, lest when I minister to others, I would become a castaway. Yes. And so who are you leading? Right now, man, I, I'm leading me through the Holy yes. Spirit in my life. Yes. 
And pretty soon, maybe I'll get a friend that I can give him what I got. But in the meantime, man, I'm just having a hard time, hard enough time and, and enough job just keeping me on the right track through the Amen. Spirit of God. But you are. You're, you're, you're being led. You're following the leading of the Holy Spirit. You're yeah. following after him. And so that's the difference. But that doesn't make a person a leader in the sense of authority, but rather a sense of his actions. And so my actions are demonstrating leadership. Maybe not in, in, in terms of authority, but definitely my actions. Man, that people really, that person really has some, some, some attributes of a leader. Yeah, he's acting like a leader. Well, that doesn't mean that person's parading around and giving marching order. Man, yeah. you, know what, you know what I look for in a leader? That person willing to serve. Yes. Man, the person that, man, I don't have to tell them anything because something inside of them, their leadership, always tell them that needs to get done. There's a responsibility. Yes. And they just recognize it. Yes. I think, man, that person really has some developed leadership qualities that, man, they're just inherent. There's that word again. They're just there. They have some leadership qualities that are just present inside of them because, man, they, they're, they're not waiting on somebody to, to, to smack them upside the head. Man, there's, there's the Spirit of God inside of them that's saying, listen, I've come to be the servant of all. That's what leadership, that's how it develops in our life. Ephesians 4, 11 uh, through 14, this is leaders. And it says, it was he, speaking of Jesus, who gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. To do what? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry and to build up the body of Christ. Until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God as we mature to the full measure of the stature of Christ. He said, then we will no longer be infants tossed about by the waves and carried around by every wind of doctrine and by the clever cunning of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speak the truth in love. We will in all things grow up in Christ himself who is the head. From him the whole body is fitly joined together by each supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love through the work of each individual part. Folks, if leaders have the responsibility to actuate or activate leadership in the lives of other people. And so when he's given that leader role, that leader role is to actuate or activate the leadership qualities in you. And so when that happens, what does it do? It brings you to a place of maturity. It brings you to a place where, man, you've got this radar for false doctrine. It just immediately, I mean, you're you're, you're on it. I I remember a number of years ago we were in the church and somebody stood up in the pulpit. and We were visiting. I think we were doing some music or something at a church. And uh, I, I was sitting probably about three, three, four, uh, 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 three quarters of the way back with, with Mel, and the person in the pulpit said something that was just so far off the rails doctrinally. And every head of everybody that we'd taken with us, we probably had 35 or 40 people with us, they were scattered throughout. Every one of them immediately turned and looked at us. I'm like, yeah, I know it's false doctrine. I know what they say. It was so funny. Every head just turned immediately. Now, I didn't have to wave my arm and say that. It was, it was, I mean, it, was, it wasn't something so enormously pronounced, but definitely it was, it was just totally deviating from the truth, and every head turned. Why? Because they had been given that radar yeah. to their leaders. Yeah. Their leaders had told them, listen, it's kind of like the, 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 the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians. They received the word readily, but, man, they searched the Scripture to see if those things were so. Come on. And so that radar comes up through leaders activating leadership inside of you and your leadership will make you keenly aware of those things that just yeah. fly into the face of what he mentions to us right there in in, 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 in verse 14. Yeah. And so we have the responsibility to activate or actuate leadership in the lives of the body of Christ. Yeah. So effective leaders will be able to draw out the qualities of leadership from a person that has the Spirit of God deposited in their life. And so the Spirit of God is deposited into Lewis's life now, my job isn't to deposit the Spirit of God in his life. I don't have that empowerment. I, I can't say, uh, I, I can't build a fire tunnel and have you run over it and say, fire, 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 and suddenly you have the Spirit of God. That Man, that's way above my pay grade. But he'll give you his Spirit if you ask him for it. Yeah. If you seek him, you'll find him. Yes. Now, my responsibility is to help you draw that out. Here's how you draw that. God deposited it in you. So through, he's giving you leadership. So leaders are going to say, hey, here's how you activate those things that God has given you. Well, I can say that. Why? Because 2 Timothy 1, 6 and 7, he said, wherefore, Paul speaking to a young Timothy, he said, I want to put you in remembrance to stir up the gift, which is yes. in you, to activate the gift that is in you by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. God has not given 
but a power of love and a sound mind. So God gave you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind, and so I'm going to help stir it up. Yes. I'm going to help stir those things up. We stir them up through 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 counsel. We stir them up through discipleship. We stir them up through uh, opportunity. We put you in situations where you need what he gave you. Yes. Uh, he deposited so many. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put you in a situation where you're going to find out exactly what God's depositing inside of you. Hallelujah. But I didn't know I could do that. Thank you, Lord. Lewis used to be so reluctant to go to the streets with us. <laughs> you remember that? Y'all even remember that verse of him? It's so funny. Ah, oh, but old man, I got out here. You know, he said no, but he was so cool saying no. I mean, I just, I felt bad like putting him on the spot. But he don't feel that way anymore. Man, that dude's grabbing people, hugging all up on flow, preaching, getting bold. I mean, really, it's just like it's natural. Oh, I know. Why? Because it is natural. Why? Because God has not given him a spirit of fear, but a power yes. of love and a sound mind. How do I know that? Because I've seen it. I seen when he said, oh, no way, that's trying to kill me. That's trying to keep me from the peace of God and the presence of God. Oh, no, 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 no. Even though I was identified by that, I can't be identified by that anymore. I want to be identified by something else. I need God to activate those things yes. in my life. Thank First you. Timothy 4, 1 and 2, and then 12 through 16. It says, now the Spirit expressly speaks that in latter times some will depart from the faith. Yes. They'll give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They'll speak lies and hypocrisy. It says they'll have their conscience seared with a hot iron. But he said to Timothy in, in 12 through 16, he said, don't let any man despise your youth, yes. your inexperience. Yes. He said, but be an example of the believers in word, conversation, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. He said, until I come, he said, I want you to give attendance to reading, to exhortation, yes. and to doctrine. He said, don't neglect that gift that's in you. Yes. He said, which was given you prophetically with the laying on hands of the presbytery. Yes. He said, meditate by the leaders. Okay, yeah. that's who that is. It isn't some random person that showed up and said, hey, I got a word for you. God does not walk disorderly like that. Do you hear me? Amen. He's given a pro uh, apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers. Amen. Not the, the, the apostle at large or the pastor at large or the evangelist at large. Amen. All, that's, that, all that is is people that lack accountability. I'll tell you right now, that's a, that's a lack of accountability. If you see this person, hey, listen, I'm a prophet. Well, really, well what church do you, are you the prophet of? Well, I'm the prophet at large. Well, you can go at large then, but you need the prophet of my life. Because somebody's going to speak to me, they're going to be accountable. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to have to answer for that. If somebody prophesies, let it be by two or three and let the others judge. Yeah. So are you giving me that word so I can judge that word? Or are you giving me that word you're saying, thus saith the Lord? Because if you're giving me a word and, and it's not the Lord, and I tell you it's not, it's not the Lord, are you going to repent now? And sit down from your prophetic ministry and take your sword? Mm. Most of us say no. Why? Because it's not built upon the plan of God. It's built upon the pride of man. Yes. Watch those things. Folks, listen. I, I want to back up and say this too. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, okay? We call it five-fold gifting. Mm -hmm. Generically speaking, in our culture, the, the set man or the leader of a church is called the pastor of the church. Yes. Okay. Now, let's, let's remove that term just for a second. I'm okay with that term, but let's just remove it for a second. And let's just call, call it the person responsible to shepherd that flock. Okay, yeah. let's just use the term shepherd. Now, that shepherd, biblically, could be an apostle. Amen. That shepherd could be a prophet. Yeah. That shepherd could be an evangelist. That shepherd could be a pastor. Yeah. That shepherd could be a teacher. Yeah. Okay? There's nothing that says that a church has to be led or pastored by only one of the fivefold gifts. Why? Because all of them have one responsibility. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, period. And it may have a teaching bent. It may have a, a nurturing uh, nurturing bent like a pastor. It may have a bent towards evangelism. It may have a, a bent towards the prophetic or the apostolic. But it's all that same role. To equip them for the work of the ministry. To teach them doctrine. To build them up in the faith. And so if somebody's always saying, well, listen, I want to be the pastor of the church. Well, I'm not called to pastor. I'm called to be an evangelist. So you're called to oversee a church as an evangelist with an evangelistic gifting towards that, to give that bend. Well, no, I just want to travel around. So you just want to be a Christian that's running around all the time. Yeah. That's what Christians do. Christians just go preach the gospel. Well, no, I, I'm not, I don't want to pastor the church. I want to be a prophet. So you want to equip the saints and disciple people with a prophetic bent or a prophetic leaning in your mind. No, 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 I don't want to do that. I want to go from church to church and get an offering and prophesy with folks. 
Remember, you can find that in the Bible. So, see, folks, that's where it gets so disorderly. Yes. I believe that every church will and can operate in all of those things, period. Amen. And you, what you're going to have is the basis for that going out. Now, listen, I, I get accused of being an evangelist. Honestly, I'm not an evangelist. That's not even my office, <laughs> period. I'm a minister of reconciliation. Yeah. I'm the most reluctant evangelist you've ever seen. I do that because God has had me do that because I'm following after Jesus. That's not my ministry gifting, so to speak. Uh, there, there's people in here that are ten times more effective in evangelism than me. But what do I do? I'm just good at stirring up those gifts in you. Yeah. To be in the conduit to, to draw those things out of you and to put you in a place where you're the most effective. I don't have to be the most effective. Why? Because I got the most effective people. So that's that. I wanted, I wanted to back up and for you start thinking, that, listen, if I'm going to lead a church, that means I have to be a pastor. In a generic sense, yes. In a biblical sense, not really. Okay? They're important. Why? Because they can create a spiritual mess. Think about James 3.1. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. Yeah. For we who teach yeah. will be judged more strictly. Greater judgment. Yeah. Greater judgment. Heavy duty. And so before you step out in the arena and start teaching the word, get ready to answer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. If you're going to step, step out and say, behold, thus saith the Lord, and you're going to step out teaching that, mm -hmm. amen, don't start crying when you get challenged. Uh -oh. you know I mean? Don't start backing off and get your, get your feelings hurt when somebody says, ah, that, that's, that's not the truth. Amen? Mm -hmm. Why? Because if you say those things, yeah. you're going to be judged more strictly. There's going to be a greater criteria that's going to hit you. So sometimes amen. it's better just to shut up. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yes. Because being a leader is sometimes as much about learning to shut up as it is about learning to speak up. Amen. See, good leaders, man, they can shut up just as quick as they can speak up. How do I know that? I had to learn that. Amen. <laughs> At one time I didn't have a shut up button. Amen. Now I'm going to speak up. I'm going to do this. Like I said, I was just some young, arrogant punk that needed somebody to put me in line. And you know what? He put me in line. Thank you, Lord. How many of you consider yourself to be religious? Which definition? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all these safe people in here now. You're not the fall religion. I'm, I'm religious. <laughs> Isn't it funny how religion became a dirty word? Well, James 1.26 says, if any of you claim to be religious, yes. now he wouldn't say it in a bad sense. Right? He wouldn't say that in bad. He said, but if any of you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you're yes. fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Yes. He didn't say religion is worthless. No. Right? What is, what is religion? What does it even mean? Do you even know what it means? What does it mean? I don't know. But you always think about it in a bad sense, don't you? Well, here's, any of you... Desire, it's it's thrustas, and it means those that are devout or devoted, those that fear the Lord. So if any of you claim to fear the Lord, how many of you besides me fear the Lord? <laughs> me and Lewis over here, we fear the Lord, don't we? See, I don't have no problem with somebody calling me religious. Why? Because I know the Bible. The Bible yes. doesn't say it's a bad thing. Yes. You know, if you're saying if I'm a part of a specific religion, so to speak, well, I'm, I'm a, I, I want to be a man that fears the Lord. Yes. But if any of you claim to fear the Lord or to be devoted to the Lord and don't control your tongue, he said you're fooling yourself and probably nobody else. Yes. And your claim to fear the Lord or be devoted is worthless. Yes. Because pure religion and genuine are those that really fear the Lord, those that are really devoted in the sight of God and the Father means you care for orphans and widows yes. and in distress. And you refuse to let the world corrupt you. In other words, you refuse to be identified by your old nature. Amen. You hear me? If I'm identified by my old nature, I'm corrupted. I talk all the time. I'm a busybody. I'm all those things that I shouldn't be. Yes. But if I'm not corrupted by my old nature, I keep myself uncorrupted by the world. And what do I do? I care for people. Yes. I love people and I. Keep my mouth shut. I bridle my tongue. Mm -hmm. In other words, I don't let the worldly way of thinking, the sinful nature, corrupt or influence the way I think or lead in any matter. Yes. Amen? Amen. 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 That's your intro to 
Leadership 2021. We're going to start. Once again, um, if you